you can't please them by not having children. That's not enough. And they bring in uh, the immigrants, according to Thatch, Maggie Thatcher and others, because there's not enough people getting born in these countries to pay off their debts. That's, that's the excuse they give for mass immigration. Even in the more developed countries, this guy says here, and notably in the United States, surveys show couples desiring more children than are necessarily for a replacement. Thus, we cannot rely on the self-interested choices of individual couples to meet society's needs. The only acceptable goal is zero rate, zero rate of growth, because any rate of growth continued long enough leads to astronomical figures. Given existing preferences in family size, governments must go beyond voluntary family planning. To achieve zero rate of population growth, governments will have to do more than cajole. They will have to coerce. Now, I've already read the articles recently where it's in the big papers in Europe and Britain especially. They're demanding this. These big organizations are demanding. And they're all on the boards. They're appointed to the boards of government. They're demanding that the, the government gets in and literally decides who should have children, who will not, and who should be sterilized. These guys have never changed their techniques or their tactics because way back to the late 1800s and even beyond before when, when, when Malthus first came out with, he was the first propagandist for what? For the big bankers because they run on numbers and populations and debt and long term interest and who pays off etc. That's what it was for. This beautiful winner here, this Miss Mr. Uh, Notstein the logical target for legal and institutional pressures is the family pressures to postpone marriage, economic pressures and inducements for married women to work outside the home. Now, this, this was written a long time ago. They've done it all, right? Pressures to postpone marriages, that, that's done everywhere. Economic pressures and inducements for married women to work outside the home, that was done a long time ago. Provision of free abor abortions for all women requesting them. Listen to this part. Downgrading of familial roles, that's the dad they're talking about really, in comparison with extra familial roles and restriction of housing and consumer goods. Such institutions, uh, changes, institutional changes supply motivation for family limitation and the provision of free abortions affords a means. The implications of such major institutional changes go far beyond population control. The family is the basic social unit of society and its major institution for the socialization of the children. To impose more drastic changes on a large scale implies many risks, not least to the regime, the regime that undertakes them. The price for this type of population control may well be the institution of a totalitarian regime. So he's saying here that have to go to war completely on the family and, and downgrade family roles. Man, the man now is out of the picture, according to all the cartoons and comedies and so on. He's an idiot. His class is an idiot in entertainment. Has been for, oh, 30 odd years now. Now, these links I'll put up on my website at the end of the show. I've also got a PDF but of Goldstein, uh, Goldstein, I was going to say Goldstein. I think that's who Orwell was thinking of, this guy, Goldstein. Uh, a PDF of Notstein's work, and you can see how detailed and in depth, and look at all the organizations that are now in charge of our system. And where they want to go back with more after this break. You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network because you can handle the truth. I'm Alan Watts, and we're cutting through the matrix. You know, down through the years, you watch all these organizations at the bottom on TV demonstrating my body, my choice, etc., never knowing that it's a much, much bigger agenda, and the ones at the top really don't keep a damn about you or your body. They get you to, to demand what they want, but they're always demanding it for a different purpose, and you'll never, ever understand that because you never look into it. They've got a, an organization out there for everybody to join. And believe you me, like the Pied Piper, you don't know where it's really going to take you. You'll think you know, but you'll always be wrong. This is a massive agenda. I mentioned before how the whole culture creation industry is always programming you to the next step and the next step and the next step. And the people absorb it. They come to conclusions which become a 
opinions, but they've never reasoned anything through for them. It's all done through fiction. And I've mentioned, too, why would every department in the Western world, every government, have a department of culture where they dish out millions of dollars every year to authors, movie makers, and so on, to write stuff and stories and to wrap certain particular articles or topics into the story? They pay them to do this. Your governments pay them to do it. And, and they, they, only, they only take grant if they claim they're for radical, radical reform. Radical. And your government demands that. Think about that. Think about it. Here's one reporter here who's caught on to some of this. Took him a while, mind you. Mail Online. This is from the 2nd of June, 2009. Why do my son's books tell him all men are useless? By William Leith. Sitting on, sitting on the sofa with my four-year-old son, Billy, I was reading aloud to him from a book, Anthony Brown, by Anthony Brown. He's our favorite male children's author. We love reading together. For one thing, it's about bonding. My son asked me about the world, and I tried to explain it to him. It's a classic moment between father and son. This particular book is called Gorilla. It's about a girl called Hannah who's obsessed with gorillas and whose father takes no notice of her. There he is, the awful man, introduced on page two, sitting at the breakfast table, heading behind his newspaper. His daughter wants to talk to him, but he's not interested. He's there physically at the table, but in all other respects, he's absent. He didn't have time for anything, writes the author, Brown. On the next page, the father says, Not now, I'm busy, maybe tomorrow. And as I readed this out to my son, he looked puzzled, and it says, he asks, why? Gazing up towards me for an answer, I don't know, I said. Later I considered my son's question in more detail, and I realized that it wasn't just some dads, it was lots of dads. Why? Why is Dad in Zoo, another book by Brown, about a family trip to the zoo, such an idiot? Why is the father such an Not just an idiot, but a grumpy, overweight idiot who tries to make jokes but it's never funny, and what's more, he's always on the verge of running things for everybody else. He's a greedy slob, just like Homer Simpson. He's more childish than his children, even though he has hair sprouting from his ears. And then there's a dad in Into the Forest, another book by this author. This one's about a dad who goes missing. He's clearly a weakling. He walks out of the family home and goes to stay with his mum. A recent academic study confirmed that men, particularly fathers, are underrepresented in almost all children's books. And when they do appear, like the fathers in Gorilla and Zoo, they're often withdrawn or obsessed with themselves or just utterly ineffectual. Take our favorite female author, Julia Donaldson. I started with her most famous book, The Gruffalo. The Gruffalo is male, and he is also a dad. His main characteristic is that he's an idiot, a complete fool. The butt of the book's jokes. He's outsmarted by a mouse. Actually, the mouse outsmarts various other, other animals too. A fox, an owl, and a snake. They're all male. But we never get to know if the mouse is male or female. The mouse is just a mouse. Again, I thought of my son's questions. Why? Why are so many male characters in books such idiots? I don't think Julia Donaldson is a male basher, but still a, a gentle thread of male idiocy runs through her books. Two of her favorites are The Snail and the Whale and Tiddler. Both are about adventurous young creatures. The snail travels the world on the back of a whale and is smart and resourceful at every point. Tiddler, a little fish, also has adventures, but this fish is a bit of a dreamer and eventually it's caught up in a trawler net. Tiddler is lucky to escape, whereas the snail calls the shots and ends up saving the whale's life. And guess what? The snail is female, and Tiddler, of course, is a guy. As the penny dropped, I looked at all the other books I've been reading to my son. There's The Selfish Crocodile by Faustin Charles and Michael Terry. It's about a male crocodile who wants everything for himself, thereby ruining the lives of all the other animals in the jungle. And then there's Giraffes Can't Dance, in which a giraffe called Gerald tries to dance and looks like a total fool, an idiot. And someone else began to strike me. As a, as something else struck me as I looked at these stories. The stories I used to introduce my son to the ways of the world not only were they full of bad male stereotypes, deadbeat dads, absent fathers, idiots, wimps, and fools, but I have been totally colluding with them. And it didn't bother me at all until I started to think about it. It had seemed normal to me. I've looked at all the comedies we've seen for the last 30 years, where you see a, 
a, a man in a house who isn't an immature fool, an idiot. <laughs>